Hello and welcome to this episode of Runners Only with Dom Harvey. Coming up, Liam Malone. Malone throws himself down after the line. He's thrown everything into it. He's done the double, I'd suggest. The 200-400. One time I was at a Tall Blacks game. My foot came loose during one of these <laughs> three-point competitions. <laughs> My foot spinning around. I'm on the court. And, oh, it's just like So stuff like that would happen all the time. Liam Malone from Nelson became a household name back in 2016 when he burst onto the Paralympic scene in Rio and won gold medals for the 200 and 400 and a silver medal for the 100. He was born with a condition that meant he was unable to walk properly, so his parents, when he was a toddler, made the impossibly difficult decision on his behalf to amputate his feet. I would say this podcast is a story, but that would be BS. We do cover a lot of stuff, but I still think we only scratch the surface of the driven, unique, complex, hilarious and intimidating Liam Malone. I've known Liam a bloody long time and I'd consider him a mate, but I'm intimidated by the guy. He just, he's working on a different level to 99.9% of us. The dude's crazy. In a good way. Just before we crack into Liam, I'd love it if you could do me a favour. If your podcast platform allows, please rate this podcast or write a review for it. And if you like what you hear, please recommend it to a friend or two who you think may like it. Word of mouth is, in my opinion, the most effective form of marketing there is. Of course, there's no pressure to do any of this at all. Ultimately, I'm just glad you're here, and I really hope you enjoy Liam Malone on Runners Only. Runners Only, yeah, yeah, let's get it started. This is Runners Only with Dom Harvey. Fast paced, slow and steady, anywhere you coming. Just want to connect for everyone who loves running. This is Runners Only, yeah, yeah, let's get it started. This is Runners Only with Dom Harvey. Uh, fast paced, slow and steady, any way you coming. Uh, just want to connect for everyone who loves running. Hey, Runners Only with Dom Harvey. Runners Only with Dom Harvey and Liam Malone, uh, one of the, the, the baddest men in the world on the track. I want to talk about that. Uh, yeah, I think it's hilarious that you could ever identify someone in the Paralympics as being, as being the baddest man. I think that's <coughs> ironic, but. What do you mean? It's the Paralympics, man. You were the baddest in that. Uh, like you, I mean, you, you, Oscar, like, Oscar Pistorius, um, who, who was a ba- he was the baddest man in another way. Um, Correct. But you, you eclipsed his times. You started the sport and you just dominated and then you just turned your back on it. Yeah, I mean, in some capacity, I think, for background, um, maybe I explain why I went to the Paralympics, like double amputee. Um, the Paralympics changed the way that blades could be designed. And the Paralympics, to me, should be the intersection of technology and human performance. Now, the Olympics, the able-bodied Olympics, has gotten to a point where it's, for the most part, a measurement of genetic potential. And there's not a whole lot of technology that's involved besides, like, all the countries that are using statewide doping. (laughs) State-sponsored doping. Um, They're doing a good job on the technology side. But the Paralympics has all this... um, has this giant gap to fill on the performance side by leveraging technology. But then you end up with this massive delta between developing countries and developed countries where developing countries have no competitive advantage. And so then you end up with this delta gap between the performance of people with disabilities from, say, a a country from African origin, perhaps, and New Zealand, where we are experts in using carbon fibre to build rockets, sailing ships, prosthetics. And so the Paralympics changed the rules because it was unfair, but the downside of that was that the Paralympics will plateau in terms of how far people with disabilities can perform. So you, you, got, the, you got the medals, you got the records, did what you wanted to do, and then... Bounced. I feel like... You, have you got ADHD? Uh, I don't know. You were talking to my girlfriend before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I feel like I, I do, but I'm of an age where these things were never diagnosed. But I, I feel like you're – I mean, we're recording this at 7 a.m. on a Sunday fucking morning. I've been trying to pin you down for this podcast for months. I'd, I'd consider you like a, a friend, I guess. Yeah, totally. You know, I've, known, I've known you for many years. I've tried so hard to get you on my podcast. And I'm a busy guy. I'm a busy guy. But you've got me. 7 a.m. is my favorite time of the day. So you've got me. Okay, so not only do you have me at my favorite time of the day, you have me at my most important productive time of the day, my most precious time of the day. So you, yes, it has taken a while to get my time, but I'm giving you the best time that I have to give. If you got me at 4 p.m., 
I've been up since four, so <laughs> I'd be I'd be useless. I'd be miserable and grumpy. Yeah, what are you doing today, though? So you, we're doing this podcast now, seven a.m. I've run the dog for an hour. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm going to go work out. I've got a. Oh, you haven't been into the garage? No. I've got a bike erg in there. Right. You know what a bike erg is? Mm, yeah, yeah. Concept yeah. two bike erg. Um, and then I'm going to go hit the gym, and then I'm going to hit the sauna and steam room, and then I'm going to come back and continue building the studio that we're in. Right. Yeah. This is like um, we're in a. Uh, it looks like it's a spare bedroom, but you're turning it into like a, a vlogging or a YouTube. YouTube studio. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So how are you? You good? I am superb. I don't think I've ever been better. What do you make? Well, why? Well, I have an awesome dog, got an awesome girlfriend, I have an epic job, and life's going pretty superbly. Yeah, but, but the I, only the only downside the only downside that I don't have is an obsession, and that's the thing that I need <laughs> is like an obsession, and that's the an one thing that, that just anything you just need something to be obsessed about. But and it, because because of the because of what you identified with, I don't think I've got ADHD, mm, but I'm definitely mm. on some form of spectrum with attention. And no, because you you talk about needing an obsession. One like oh, I don't know side effect trait or whatever of ADHD is a thing called hyperfixation. Mm. So you say you need an obsession. Maybe you need something to hyperfix. Maybe exactly. You, yeah. Yeah. But um, anyone listening to the, a lot of people listening to this would probably be like, well, you seem like like you do have obsessions. Like the fact that you you've got a gym at home and you've got this and you got that. Maybe I get stuck yeah. into building things. Like all of this is mine. This isn't <laughs> yeah. even Madison. So my girlfriend works in media, but all of this is mine. So yeah. I built all of this to date. Which, to be fair, I've poorly painted the walls black to kind of make it look cool. Which it looks dope when it's in shot, and the rest of the room sucks. Yeah. So I haven't. When I say I've built it, I've done fuck all. But it's going to get there. It's going to be awesome. Oh, and it will. Like you, you just don't do anything by halves. Didn't grow my body completely. That was by half. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, all right. Let, yeah. That would be number one. I mean, the <laughs> yeah, most, the, the okay, most important, yeah, did yeah. you grow your whole body? No, fucked it. Okay, so, um, yeah, let's go right back to the beginning. So you're from Nelson? Nelson Stoke. Originally, you're yeah. from Stoke and Nelson. You're born, with, you're born with your legs, born with your legs and your feet. Yeah, for um, the most part. But they, you, you were, so, I've, I've, with, I've, seen, I've seen video footage of you walking as a toddler and you're... Yeah, okay, so I was born with fibula hemimelia, it's the absence. I would usually lie about this, by the way, but... <laughs> what, like shark attack? Yeah, all sorts of nonsense, yeah, yeah. but everyone knows. I need to get more creative at this point. But I was born with fibula hemimelia, and I guess if someone was like thinking about their own leg, they would have their tibia, which is their shin bone. They would have the fibula, which they can't really feel, but it runs down behind the shin bone, which provides stability... To the ankle. So when I was learning to walk, I didn't have my fibulas, and but I had my feet, which is bizarre. And my ankles snapped and rolled inwards. So I learned to walk on the the insides of my toes. Yeah, I've, I've seen like a handy cam footage of you walking as a as a kid online. Ridiculous! And, and, yeah, and, and cut you, those things off. Your, your your feet are sort of like a ninety degree angle. Yeah, like to, out, to the, out, outwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So you you see, your parents made the call when you were like two. Eighteen months. Eighteen yeah. months. So, do you do you have any recollection of having feet, or is it just sort of subliminally through like seeing old footage? I have no recollection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they they made the call for you. Um, Fortunately, and- because I've met guys whose parents went in the op- opposite direction. So the two pathways is: do you amputate the legs and hope that prosthetic technology gets better, or? Do you not amputate the legs and hope that medical insertions of steel rods and other surgeries get better? Now, I met this German guy at the Paralympics who is now a double amputee. Uh, His parents didn't go down that pathway. And then on top of that, they did not give him consent until he turned 18 in Germany to make that decision. So he turned 18. He'd spent his entire life in crutches because... There's no way you could go through surgery after surgery as you grow to put in an artificial bone. Mm. And he was essentially a cripple. Kind of like what I'd imagine. Like I think there's like a character in South Park who's kind of like that. <laughs> and, and so he kind of just went around his whole life kind of not being able to m- move through space and time. And then he got the amputations. And now he's, he's fucking insane. He's doing diving. He's doing rock climbing. He's at the Paralympics. He lives a very normal life. And so I was so lucky that my parents decided... To, to amputate, you, you can understand it from both sides, though. Like, um, it's a terrifying decision. It's an awful decision because, um, I mean, you, 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 you can see that your parents made the right decision, but you know, if you were like, "What the fuck, you guys, you guys decided to cut my legs off." Yeah, and I think no parent wants to have a disabled Absolutely. child, and then beyond that, 
there's complexities in having a child with a disability when then you, then you have to make f- decisions that have like forward impact mm. forward impacts on that child's life and so you know if, if a child's born with say some sort of disease that puts them in a wheelchair well then a lot of the time they might not there might not be any other decisions that's just the way it is but then for me they have an onus of responsibility on the outcomes of my life yeah. because then that's where the challenge lies so yeah it would have been hard for them fucking hard for them yeah um yeah how was that was it was that challenging what like what, what are your earliest sort of memories Devast- so devastating from for them for sure but the moment they amputated my legs well one like you've seen footage of me as a toddler mm. and i'm walking on two broken ankles so they were already looking at me as a toddler going like he's determined to do things like i'd chase balls around and whatever the moment they did the amputation and i got my first set of prosthetics I was just like running around, I was walking, yeah. and I was, I was loving life. And having my amputations, for whatever reason, it's extremely painful, constantly. Not now while we're sitting down, but anytime I'm walking, if I was to go out on a night out, I'd have to get, I, I do get extremely drunk because I'm in so much pain that I have to drink to counter the pain. So yeah, so growing up, that was, that was always tough, but I, it's, it's been fun. Regardless. <laughs> it's been fun. Well, like, it's been more fun than had I had the squid leg tentacle things. Yeah, as yeah, a yeah, situation. yeah, yeah. You know, that would have been fucking disastrous. Okay, well, if it's if it's painful just to just to walk and go about your daily business, then I'm guessing, like, training for events and running and running yeah, long distance, fucking fast. Long distance is horrible. So, like, I've done quite a few half marathons. Yeah, and you did a, you did a marathon. You, I, I, I mean, you, you had me up for some advice, and then you took none of it, and you ran a marathon with no training. And, and that got me. And that wasn't because... <laughs> an and, I, and I got to the end, and I was like, I should never have done it because, <laughs> I, was, was uh, because I was an amputee. And that's the reason I thought I failed. And then I did... I trained properly for the halves, and I went through in, like, 119. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, you know, you actually have to... You can't just roll up to a full marathon. It's a more enjoyable experience if you train. Yeah, so yeah, you, yeah the Hawks Bay Marathon you did on your blade mm-hmm. uh, with very, very little training. How I didn't train. Zero <laughs> training. How, no, but you must have done some runs. No, I didn't do any runs. <laughs> I did, well, I did a, a, like a 4K because a at, 4K. This, <laughs> at this point I hadn't built the bottom of the sole. The sole on the bottom of a blade is a Nike track pad that gets like super glued to the bottom of the blade. And you can't wear a track pad on the road. And so I didn't have anything, any solution <laughs> to adapt at this point for the, the marathon. So I didn't know how I was going to be able to run. In the end, what I did for the Hawks Bay Marathon, you know those like thick sponges that you might wipe down the bench with yes. in your kitchen? I duct taped a bunch of those to the bottom and they lasted like, I don't know, 2K. <laughs> and then the rest of it, I was just like destroying the bottom of my blades. Anyway, so I got into this half marathon and I was smoking everyone for the first, not everyone, but I was smoking the average person. And I think I went through the first half, including stops to get duct tape, uh, more sponge, and everything. So I probably had like a couple of two to three minute stops. I went through the first half in like an hour 30. Wow. And I was like, that's pretty good. Yeah. For like not training. And then I just hit the wall. And I was done, man. 2K after that halfway mark on that full marathon. It wasn't anything to do with being an amputee. I just was unfit. And and then on top of that, I had extreme pain. So I had to have a doctor bike alongside me feeding me tramadol and nerve blockers because I'd done something to the bottom <laughs> of my stumps. And so anyway, I got, get through the first half of this, this marathon and I'm in like probably the top 25%. By the last five kilometers, I had an 80-year-old grandmother pass me in the back like, I think, last 50, and she runs past me. She goes, I never thought I'd beat an Olympian, and I'm throwing up on the side of the road, and this doctor's with me telling me to give up, and I'm thinking, fuck this grandma, and uh, she beat me. And anyway, I get to the end of this. <laughs> it's very um, humbling, eh? Yeah, it was it's a great extremely level. humbling. I get to the end of this thing after crawling for parts of it. I get through in, like, four hours something. I run to the end, they're like, how do you feel? I feel great. I go to say, I feel great. And this poor report, I just throw up everywhere in front of them. And that was my first experience. And last, one and done. Well, of the four, I've done heaps of halves. Oh, yeah. But uh. the reason you have to, like most people would have <laughs> believed me they would have given up. Yeah. I was in so much pain. And but that's your sort of you tenacity, to to, isn't it? Yeah, but well, you have to finish stuff like that. You have to get to the end. And the next day, like, the bottom, like, it'd be, like, the sole on the bottom of your heel. 
like ripped off from the bottom of my stump. It was, I had to take like a week off work and it was, by the way, the only reason I did it was because a bunch of my work colleagues were like, hey, let's all do the, the marathon together. And then six weeks out, I'm like, have you guys started training? They're like, no, nah, but we're still doing it. And then, then I it was like two days before and I said, hey, you guys going down? Where are you staying? And I was the only one that entered mm. from work. So I got stitched up. So w- where were you working then? I was working at a company called Soul Machines, which is a New what, Zealand... Soul Machines? Soul Machines, which is a New Zealand technology startup that is building autonomously animated digital human beings. And they're built on top of artificially intelligent natural language generation engines, which would be the type of technology that would underpin something like Siri. God, how, how old are you now? You've already had so many different careers. I've been a runner and I've worked in technology. No, what, you work at Amazon now. And what I work at Amazon, but that's, that's Amazon Web Services. It's still within technology. Okay, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. I want to try and go in some sort of order here. So so you're growing up in Nelson, you, your parents make the very difficult but correct call to um, amputate your, your, your feet and your ankles when you're 18 months old. I'm guessing the technology then for prosthetics was, wasn't that good? Pretty similar to what a pirate would have had. So like, a, <laughs> well, they didn't have, I don't think they would have had rubber feet, but like wood, fiberglass, rubber in combination, and there was like a rubber foot, and then there'd be like a weird wood like separator that they would connect to the fiberglass. Anyway... The wood between the foot and the fiberglass uh, served for like a screw to go through the bottom of this rubber foot into, and the screw would always come loose. So like one time I was at a either a Tall Blacks or a Giants game, and you know how they have like the half court competition or like the three pointer competition <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. for like the kids. My foot came loose during one of these <laughs> three point competitions. My foot spinning around. I'm on the court, and ah, oh, it's just a nightmare. So stuff like that would happen all the time. So the technology was useless. And then, like, every single sport I sucked. Swimming sports. I'd start out parallel. I would kick. My fucking feet would absorb the water. You know, I'd start out aqua jogging. You know, it's just, it was one terrible set of events to another. And you would, you would have been the only, without a doubt, the only kid at your school with... With fake legs? Yeah. Yeah, there weren't a whole lot of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, Nelson's not, Nelson's, Nelson's, Nelson's not bred. Did, did that feel quite lonely? What, what were you like as a kid? Like, I'm, I'm guessing you were quite popular. You, I mean, you're... you're I'm just a normal kid. Was, I mm. mean, my, my school was awesome. My friends were awesome. My parents treated me as normal. And then the most important thing is that nothing's... Like, if you want to be treated as an equal... Your legs have to be the target of jokes if you want to be equal. You cannot put like a kid for whatever reason in some cotton wool for whatever characteristic that separates them. And so, like, yeah, a, a early on, where my legs the butter jokes and continue to be, but like it was slightly challenging. I'd say by the time intermediate came around, I was probably like the case of like the bullied becomes the bully. But like, not not so severe. What, what, but, were you the bully? No, I wouldn't say I was the bully, yeah. but I was, you know, like I was. Yeah, not, you you, not gave, a bully. It, you yeah. gave it as good as yeah, what you yeah, could get. Yeah, absolutely, it. absolutely. Okay. Okay. So, so I was through as a kid. Were there moments where I would go home, like after fucking cross country or athletics days, and I would, you know, be five to to nine or ten, and I would cry because you know I wish that I had real legs. Absolutely. What, but I think those events are good to go through. Why? Well, because they build like resilience and yeah, they character, build character and character yeah, building days. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's still rough though. Were you sort of like a self deprecating? Like, did, did you get jokes in before anyone else could? Were you that yeah. sort of kid? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As a as a defense mechanism, and or? also it's just smart. It's kind of like you see Eight Mile and Eminem. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the rap battle that he wins He <laughs> yeah. goes at himself harder first Before, you know, yeah, the yeah. other guy can And then he rebuts the, the other guy So it's kind of like stealing someone's thunder Yeah That's the way to think about it's, it it's, 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 it's the same way that like in a debate You know, you would you would look for What the, uh, you know, counter team would, would hit you with first it's a, It does feel like it's a Kiwi thing, though. Like, you need to get in before someone else does, which which kind of sucks in a way, I think. It, it does, and it also sucks because we do it not just in things that, unfortunately, we're bad with, but things that we're great with as well. Mm, how do you mean? Well, just like with success and stuff, I think there's it's just like the Kiwi attitude, right? Yeah, I think you're right. We're just uh, downplaying what you've done. Correct. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah, otherwise it's just seemed braggy or egotistical or something. Exactly. 
Your, your mum your mum got sick well, like when you were 12. She got, yeah, so 12, she was diagnosed, she diagnosed with stage, cancer. stage 3, going on stage 4 bowel cancer. Um, Fuck you, mate, you went through some shit. <clears throat> well, I had Jesus. no idea what cancer meant. Like, conceptualising cancer as a 12-year-old, the first question I asked was, is it contagious? So I was, like, looking across the table at her, like, <laughs> in part, t- terrified that my mum was going to die, and then in part, like, can I catch whatever she has? Uh, and then they had to kind of, like, run me through what cancer was, and then go through this explanation that she was going to have to go down to Christchurch and undergo all the surgery, have her bowels cut apart, get a colostomy bag. A colostomy bag, for those who don't know, is when you go through bowel cancer, they'll typically remove the part of the bowel that has the cancer. They will put a hole in the side of your uh, abdomen and you'll have this bag that your bowel connects to and, like, that's essentially your arsehole. Mm. And then you have this bag and it's, you know, socially awkward. It makes sounds. It's like having an arse on the side of your stomach. It's It's... T- does it make sense? What, what sounds does it? Like gurgling noises? Yeah, gurgling noises. Right. Di- digesting noises, right? But it's yeah. slightly louder because you don't have the insulation mm. from the abdomen. And so for her, you know, that was extremely tough from a social point of view. Oh, and mate, you don't well, want to see an adult go through those things. And yeah. then, you know, I watched her get cleared of cancer the first time and you retain so much hope and then the cancer comes back and you lose that hope and then it's cleared again, you get a little bit of hope back, but you have that element of doubt. And then the third time I actually realised, when I the way that I found out she was going to die was I read this letter from a specialist that said the cancer had metastasized throughout <laughs> her body and was in her vital organs. And so... How, how old were you then? 18. Oh, 18. 17. 17. I was in the last year of school and I was learning in biology how cells spread throughout the body. And so my understanding was like I was learning biology and how cells spread and we were, you know, cancer is so relevant. So that's usually like a topic of like case studies. Mm. And then, you know, I'm seeing it play out in real life and the consequences of that. So that was... So she was, she's, she's living with it for five years. Six years. She six battled years. it for six years. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. She died when I was 18. But she was, you know, she was an extraordinarily tough woman, and I took so many things from her. So, uh, her, her, like, uh, two things. She had a very rough upbringing, but she was just like a cleaner at the hospital for the majority of her life. Uh, she began a landscaping business in Nelson, a small business, but it took off pretty rapidly. My mom was just like a wonderful woman with people. She was diagnosed with cancer. She continued it. And one of the things she told me was, like, don't wait until you begin to die to, like, pursue what you love. Because she's just, like, Mm. green thumb, epic gardener. Our property was always stunning. People would always compliment her her on it. And it was only until she had that realization that she was probably going to die soon that she actually took the risk of pursuing her dreams. So, you know, always do that. The second thing was she always wanted to live on a farm. So we moved out to a farm after she was cleared from cancer. And... You know, the cancer came back. We, we stayed on the farm. This woman would, she's insane. She would have chemotherapy, radiation. She would have this colostomy bag. She lost all this weight. She must have been like 50 kilos. And she would be out there at 5 a.m. in the morning moving cows, yelling at the dogs, yelling at the animals. She would be, you know, watching my dad and I attempt to try and fix fences. And so her capacity for dealing with pain was extraordinarily high. And then her capacity to just continue to work extremely hard was extremely high. And when I was a teenager, you know, that um, didn't necessarily have a profound effect on me. But now I look back and I'm like, it's such a It shaped you. It shaped me for sure. And it's also shaped my tolerance of other people's whinging because... I'm not that empathetic and I'm not that tolerant to other people because I've witnessed what, uh, both from her and just like people I've met in the Paralympics and people I've met through life who have gone, for whatever reason I you know, have encountered all of these people, have gone through extraordinarily tumultuous times and continued to work extremely hard that when people whinge and moan, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy, mm. and, which is not a good thing because like a little bit of sympathy can help people through things, but... I'm not, yeah. I'm not. I'm not a good person to, <laughs> uh, to I, carry the weight of things. I've known you for quite a few years. I've got nothing but admiration for you. If you were to like whinge to me about a relatively minor problem, even if it was probably significant, I don't know if I'd be that empathetic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I won't tell you about my uh, my my knee injury at the moment. So, uh, so who is in your family? You, your mum, your dad, any other siblings? Uh huh. I got a secret family. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, what? Yeah, I know it's wild. So I grew up thinking I had a half brother in Perth. And I moved to Perth when I was 18, right after my mum died. Um, eventually found out that my half-brother in Perth was a methamphetamine addict. 
Anyway, so he went into rehab. I moved back to New Zealand. I went into university, whatever. Go to the Olympics, blah, 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 blah. I moved to London. I'm working with Soul Machines. And I get this phone call from my dad saying, hey, I'm coming to London. My dad arrives in London. And I'm like, all right, that's weird. But my dad's always traveled globally with work. He shows up. He shows me a photo of this young kid. I'm like, oh, have you sponsored a child? He's like, no, it's your younger brother. I'm like, what? And so I had a secret family that I never knew about for three years and with a younger brother and who I now lives at my family home. So, you, so your dad um, had another family after after your mum passed. Correct, but never right. told me about it. What, why did it? Why was it a secret? Well, they're from the Philippines, and I think he felt conflicted about it and. For whatever reason, he holds on to things. Like, he still has all my mum's stuff at home, and, like, it's mm. nice, but it's like, I don't know if he just knew how to bridge it, and I'm also a Is jaded it? individual. But anyway, I, I have this beautiful <laughs> younger brother named Tyler, and he's the most gorgeous young kid, super handsome, super charismatic, super bright. Anyway, so I find out I have this younger brother, and I say to my dad, this is while he's telling me, have you told Paul yet, who's my half-brother in Perth? Perth yeah. He goes, why, why would I tell Paul? He's not, he's not my son. And I'm like, huh? And so I find out that Paul's not my biological half-brother. And the same day that I find out that I've got a new half-brother, <laughs> even though we, you know, I still think of Paul as my older half-brother, but it's just one of those family things that's part of life and it's, it'd be easy to get caught up on, but I just think it's all, I think it's all one funny and then pretty wonderful and we have a great relationship on on all parties, so it's it's fine. And my older brother, who you know, sadly got involved in, in methamphetamine, he went through rehab. He's out of it, and uh, he's just written a book about that journey. and And he's a phenomenal guy. So, props to him as well. Are you, are you good with these things at the time, or is it just that, that a I'd passage say of time has passed? Thirty you're... minutes. Um, thirty in minutes. Shock. No, yeah. thirty minutes. I'm jaded. A lot of expletives coming out of my mouth, and then past thirty minutes, I'm good to go. Right. Just got to get it out of the system a little yeah. bit. So you 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 know you lose your mum when you're eighteen. Who's like one of your you know, one of your one of your cheerleaders, one of your biggest fans, one of your you like your north star. How's that at that age? Well, that was That's probably a- the hardest part. Like so, losing my mum in combination with at like twelve to seventeen, I was pretty self conscious about my prosthetics. Right, it's just like natural selection. That mm. having a disability is like not good for for, <laughs> for mating. So like finding a girlfriend. Is hard, either either in my own mind or, or in reality, and I think it's both. But so I'm super self conscious about my legs and, and whatever else. And then my mum dies, and that's you know she's a foundation of confidence for me as a child. And mm. I'm kind of by myself. I'm working in Perth as a forklift driver, not really knowing how to comprehend and deal with death and, and mourn someone. So extraordinarily tough. And I think more than anything, it would have been easier had I been more myself in like the pursuit of pursuit of goals and like just like the pursuit of obsessing over things but you know I was just drifting I worked as a forklift driver not there's anything wrong with being a forklift driver but I was just drifting as a courier and a forklift driver in in Perth you have um far I don't know bigger goals or higher standards not even that it was just in fact I would happily do those jobs but the people I was surrounded by in Perth when doing those jobs were just miserable so they Mm. just made it not very pleasant yeah and um so that was that was tough. It was it's just tough, but it just it passes. It does pass. Mm. Did you like get any counselling or anything, nope. or how did you how did you Never deal with it? Never seen a counsellor. Well, eventually I dealt with it by pursuing my dreams, and that's what I think makes life yeah. wonderful. So it's lucky you didn't um, like really go off the rails, or like your the guy you thought was your half brother start taking meth, or I, I don't know. Yeah, but I've always you know I, mean? been, I was like, always a sort of dreamer a, at school. Right. Like, in a child, I was always a dreamer of wanting to go and do things, which were unrealistic in many senses, but I don't think I ever would have gone down the complete wrong path, mm. but for sure. At that age and stage of life, like 18, you, you, you could have a lot to be angry about if you want if you chose to be. Like, you lost your mum, you had fake legs. I mean, well, how, how did very, you... Yeah, but that's, that's life. That's life. Life's not, there's no, I'm not, you don't get dealt an even hand and... Uh, I was very fortunate as a young person to travel a lot, and so I you know, went to Mexico with my parents, and I can remember seeing this young kid in Mexico in Tijuana who had no legs from above the knees begging for money, which I believe you know now is like funded by the car- the cartels in there or something. It's like it's, it's, it's very dubious, but it's a scam. It's a scam. <laughs> His legs are folded underneath him. Um, get my ten dollars back. 
Um, you can always compare yourself to someone worse and make yourself, and make yourself feel good. Um, yeah, there's, there, yeah, there, but that is true. There is, there is always good. someone worse off, isn't yeah, there? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, I, I had worldly experiences that just, I've never felt the need to be angry or, like, mm. resent, resentful to the world or feel like the world owes me anything. Well, that's such a good attitude to get. Where does that come from? Is that from your mum, from your dad? Both, yeah, both. Yeah. I mean, they're both just hardworking people, like, grew up, you know, with modest means and worldly experiences, and, you know, they've both been through a lot, and and I think it's just partly genetics, right? Like, just, like, I got lucky. So your mental health's always been good? Well, no, like, I mean, after, no, like, through, I'd say, 15 through to 19, probably not. Mm. Well, definitely well, not un- good. Understandable, though. Well, not a- good, yeah, I mean, like, self-doubt, anxiety, you know, after you, like, my uncle and my mum died within three months, six months, somewhere around there. You don't have coping mechanisms. There's a lot going on. You don't have any career path, per se, like, I never thought I'd go to university or anything, and... That was extremely tough. Mm. So until the ball got rolling in a certain direction, I was like, life sucks, right? Like in every capacity possible. Mm. So that that was what was hard. Yeah. So yeah, and then that, at that point, you're extremely unhappy, you're extremely miserable. But it's like the mental health thing is, and this is just my point of view, like yeah. I've never accepted any form of external help. My philosophy around that is, is like the, the more you take externally, the, the more you need. And I'm not saying that's true of everyone, but for me, I think that's certainly true. And so, like, I just had to search deep within myself. And, external help, as in, like, pharmaceuticals, yeah, counselling? Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't, yeah, pharmaceuticals. Like, right, I would never, right. ever. I think that's a, a very slippery slope. Mm. Um, and it's an, it's extremely easy to go to. Like, it's easy to pop a pill. And I'm not yeah. saying, and this is not for anyone else, I'm not making recommendations, but it's just an extremely easy path to go down whether it's mental health or, or normal health i think there's you can always find a mm. a way from within yeah wow you're so disciplined aren't you so, so when, when, when did the oh he's just pointing to an afghan oh calm down <laughs> you're eating an afghan at seven o'clock on sunday morning you've, you've got hours to burn it off mate um so when did the running come into your life did you show some sort of natural talent at school? Absolutely or not. No. Right. Well, I didn't run for seven years. So after my mum died and I came back from Perth and went to university, I was just a, I was an idiot. So I was at university. I was drinking probably three nights a week. I was going to these. I I was just. I'll, I'll share some like stories with you. Okay. One night, next guy came to university. Um, so like massive university gig. There's I don't know like a couple of thousand people in the crowd. For whatever reason, I'm super drunk and I get this idea that I'm going to get on stage with next guy. But, but I don't just like run up on stage because immediately I'm going to get tackled, right? And so I run back to my university dorm room, I grab my DSLR, and I bring it back with a GoPro on my chest, and there's that gap between the stage and the crowd where the security sits. Yeah. So like they just allow me to walk up and down there, and I'm like getting the security to take photos with the crowd as well, and they're pulling shuckers and like security guards. I build trust with them. <laughs> And like no one, no one is like none the wiser. And all my friends are cracking up, laughing. They think it's like the greatest thing ever. And then I get on stage and take photos. And then I go to get a selfie with Nets guy. And all you hear is like, "He's not allowed to be on there." <laughs> and like security rush the stage. And I'm running back through the back of my like university events venue. And I run out stage. And there was this like fire truck that one of the university societies had bought. And I scale this fire truck. And I'm extremely drunk at this point. Like I had a whole bunch of vodka Red Bulls. And I'm 19. I've got no idea what I'm doing. The security guards surround the fire truck and as I go to run off it my dumb fake legs I trip and so I fly off this you know uh, fire truck that's like a couple of meters high can you know land on my head have this huge concussion devastating so that was like a dumb event number one luckily like didn't severely hurt myself another event um, just extremely drunk in, in Nelson I fall out of the back of a taxi and I smack my head on a curb <laughs> starts pouring out with blood I wind up in hospital <laughs> Uh, and again with a concussion uh, in Perth, I got king hit. Woke up the next day at home. So there's just That's the most every Perth time, thing yeah, of, yeah, yeah, you know, classic. Wow, yeah. And so um, I was I had a car accident, and so there were all these different events. And then it just got to a point. I was like, I have to do something to turn my life around. And I had to like give in to the idea that I had these unrealistic dreams and pursuits, and I didn't know how to get there, but I had to figure out a way to make them happen. And then there was just like somewhat of a strategy that came into play which was what can I do that's unique 
to me that is hard to replicate for others but is actually kind of easy to do. And I couldn't really think of anything. And the short of it is one of my friends suggested going to the Paralympics and I just walked into the offices in Christchurch and said, I'll go to Rio in three years' time and I'll win the 100, 200, and 400. And they were like, maybe aim for Tokyo in 2020. Because Why, because it wasn't enough of a lead-up? Yeah, who can yeah. train for the Paralympics in three years? They're like, Oscar Pistorius just won the, the able, well, not won, he got to the semifinals in the able at Olympics, yeah. and his times are faster than anyone in New Zealand for the mm. 400. Good luck. And the blades, <laughs> you need a $50,000. And But I was so, like, desperate to succeed at something. So I went back to my university dorm room, I started cold calling and cold emailing people from the, the like, MBR rich list to try and raise money for these blades. And... Um, Got no yeses. And then I uh, got in contact and met Phil Vine, who used to work at TV3, and he worked on uh, Third Degree, which was like the equivalent to Sunday at that point in time. He needed to make a documentary. He flew down. He brought down a cameraman. We put this, like, pitch together to the New Zealand public. Yeah, I couldn't run at this point. So I ran in my normal walking prosthetics. In Christchurch, there was, like, 60 metres of track left. I ran 50 metres. I threw up everywhere. I was wearing stubbies. It was just the whole thing was weird. And... They put that to the New Zealand public, and within 48 hours, I raised $50,000. And that's when my friends wow. at university are like, shit, dude, you're actually going to have to do this. And I was <laughs> fucking panicking, bro. What was I thinking? <laughs> Idiots. So I was panicking because uh, well, I'd never <laughs> run. Like, what am I, what am I doing? Well, I'm just going to like, shit, Shit's what, getting real. What am I doing? Well, I'm just going to become an Olympian now? Yeah. What are you, <laughs> fucking insane? So that's what happened, and that's how I got into it. But going back to why the Paralympics made more sense than per, than say like another thing to do, you could like because anyone who's like goal setting, right? You have to come up with a goal. Absolutely. But people people yes. are like, yeah. well, how, how do you choose something? And I looked at doing things like climbing Mount Cook. Okay, well then let's assess that idea. You climb Mount Cook. How much value does that create? Now you can think of value in terms of how much attention you're going to get. How important it is is it to the people? Not that important. Like, what are the consequences or, like, risks of going up Mount Cook? I could lose my hands as mm, well to mm. frostbite, and now I look like Patrick Starr from SpongeBob. <laughs> Do that. You really want to go down that path? You're like, you're already self-conscious about getting a, a good... So what do you... No. So you can't create that much value. The risks are very high. Okay, start a business. Do you have any capital? Do you have any experience? Do you understand what you're doing? No idea at all. Going to be a massive risk. I'll probably fail within six months, and I won't make any momentum. Incentive structures aren't, aren't that great around it. Okay, let's think about the Paralympics. Okay, well, national success is, like, important to the people. It gives, like, a sense of pride. It attracts a lot of attention. So there's, like, a value to be found in that. What are the risks? Well, the risks are, if I hadn't succeeded, I spent three years of my life in an environment with these really positive incentive structures. I have a coach who really cares about me. I have my teammates who, you know, their integrity is a reflection of my actions as well, so I have to be accountable to them. And... um, and it's relatively easy because not that many people can go to the Paralympics. You're not going to, like, how fast can you run a marathon? Uh, 257 is okay, what well, time. Yeah, and yes. could, you, could you go to the Olympics on that? Fuck no. Okay, but hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. Okay. If I told you tomorrow you could go and become a Paralympic champion, all you have to do is amputate both of your feet. You, I guarantee you, you will win. You'll be able to make a fair amount of money, but I can't tell you, it might not be more than what you're making now. Would you do it? Fuck no. Exactly. So, most people can't go to the Paralympics because they don't have two artificial legs. Exactly. Yeah, but yeah. there is this weird perception that the Paralympics is as competitive as the Olympics and therefore it gets this, you know, not the same amount of attention as the Olympics by any means, but it is perceived as being super competitive. Now, I'm not disregarding the fact that it was extremely hard to become that level of an athlete because that's all I did for three years was train in the morning and train at night for every single day for three years to get there and then I had to think about the technology side but relative to doing other things it was the most intelligent thing to do right I think you're being super modest about it like your your times were incredible Mm -hmm. I'm not disregarding that but what I'm saying is is that was still a better that was the most sensible thing to do alongside university in terms of picking a goal than say starting a business or, or right. anything else. Gotcha. So just going back like to the net sky thing and the concussions and whatnot, do you do you think uh, with the benefit of hindsight from where you are now, part of that was you just being a standy nineteen year old, or do you think part of yeah, that was totally, lashing out is, lashing out because of your mum? No, I'm just a standard nineteen year old and yeah. then on top of that I'm like I'm extremely extroverted as it is, and I do like attention. And so the, when you're in those environments, you are the one that does the, the dumb yeah. things when you're drinking. 
the other side of it is, you know, we have this massive tragedy in, I guess, most Western societies or in most societies where you have a giant time loss where kids, their, their life is wasted between 16 and 24 by spending their time at high school and then going to university mm. for the most part, which is just advanced babysitting and then a scam. And so, <laughs> and so... What, university is the scam? All of them. Well, I think unless you're doing like medicine or engineering or maybe like some form of computer science or maybe physics and chemistry, but like hard to say, I don't think it's a good use of your time. Yeah, I think right, you can probably right. just go straight into the, the work. You've got a degree though, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I have a degree, but I wouldn't recommend okay. it to anyone. But it's, so you were saying this from a, a, a position of someone that has has done it, so which I think is... Um, exactly. I mean, yeah. I, I never went to university, so I can say it's a scam and people can say, tell me to shut the fuck up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. And so, but, but, and, and, and because... Because there's no guaranteed outcome of those of those things, going to university, or spending your time at high school wisely, which is I guess like focusing on like subjects that you're not really sure why you're studying, and then going to university, and you for the most part most people take subjects that they don't know why they're studying, and they have these kind of like abstract ideas of what they'll do afterwards. Because you don't have a dedicated outcome like you'd be going to the Olympics, most people just spend their time drinking. Mm. Because what, like yeah. you're just kind of like partying and you're drifting, and it's like you know you have to balance the the boringness of university and everything else. I suppose you're, not, you're growing up as well and finding your place in the world, yeah, finding your identity exactly, first time away exactly, from Exactly, but I think there could be a better use of that time yeah. and you still have, have all of those experiences and you can still like party and socialise and everything, but I think it's worse because on the other side of it, no one's really doing anything productive with the most productive time in their lives. Mm. So with, with what you're doing now, working at Amazon, uh, is are you using your degree at all or no? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, your degrees. You know your, de- your your degrees. Sitting and reading, like reading these textbooks, which are like these retrospective analyses from people who have never worked in in a business, so like academics, and uh, you create essays and reports for them, mm. and then they like you're judged by people have never really achieved anything in their life. And I just don't think it's that good. And so I think for some people it's a good use of time, like going to university. For me, just being like the person that I am, not a good use of time. Mm. And so I had, like I was valedictorian and I had two speeches. One, which was like, not necessarily super critical of the university, but like funny, making jokes, kind of like, you know, you spent three years being, you know, receiving grades from people who've, you know, never achieved anything in their life, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh, you know what, it's, it's, it's way too rough to rain on everyone's <laughs> parade. Yeah, 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 I don't yeah. want to rain on everyone else's <laughs> parade. Like, it's a moment of, you know, success for everyone and people's parents are there. But, uh, yeah, so at 19, you know, I was drinking and, and then I decided to become a Paralympic champion. And I was lucky that it worked out. But even if it didn't, that was still a better use of time than, than anything else because I would have been healthier. Like, just all the benefits of as you know, being like uh, an athlete, whether it's a runner or whatever, it's, it's so good for you. Yeah, there's so many other other yeah, good strains and habits that go along with it. So you win gold in the... No. Silver in the 100, gold so, in the 200 and the 400. I think that's when you, you first came to my radar because um, you blew up with your speech afterwards where you said, I'm just a kid from Nelson that r- like runs around in circles and reads books. Mm. Is that the quote? Yeah, well, I mean, that's yeah. what I was doing at the time. That was hilarious. I mean, well, <laughs> like, it's just funny as hell, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was twenty two at the time, and it was and just long, was, yeah, long hair. Yeah, that's yeah. that's just, yeah. I didn't, I didn't really want to have long hair, and but you, you look like a like a, like an anarchist athlete. You know what I mean? Well, part of it was you look like a surfer. Yeah, well, the part of it was because when I went to the Paralympics, you do a training camp. So for people who don't really understand the Olympic cycle, you spend three years and you do kind of do like national competitions, maybe you go to Aussie, but then leading into an Olympic Games, you'll go and do a training camp overseas where you try to get a little bit better competition. You maybe compete against some of the people you compete against at the Olympics. I went to the United States to their Olympic training center to compete against guys that I'd be competing against in the Olympics. The Americans, as we know, don't necessarily have the wider scope of like uh, global views and so their view of New Zealand athletes was all blacks performing the haka and Stephen Adams this big giant right right who has the long NBA. hair and a big beard yeah. and he's a savage so I went there and I wanted them to think that I was a savage and so I had <laughs> long hair and a beard while I was training and I would train in the middle of the day so that they thought I was nuts because the Olympic training centers on the border of Mexico you know it's just extraordinarily hot and I get to the Paralympics, I shave the beard, and then the Olympic Village is just a nightmare because it's in Brazil and it literally bankrupted the state of Rio. And, you know, there's just like, the 
Paralympics is, of course, filled with diversity and the people that they employed, and you've got, like, barbers with, like, three fingers who are cutting hair, and I'm like, I'm not letting these people cut my hair. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and so that's that's kind of how the, the long hair came about. Oh, that was, that was really good. And, you, and your times, you, you got world records, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, beating Pistorius. Correct. And was he, he was sort of like a mentor? No, fuck no. No? No, didn't, didn't, you had some conversations with yeah, him? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I talked to him in between... Uh, when he oh, was when he, when, when he when he was released from uh, his year serving for manslaughter, right? I had been at the World Championships in Qatar and talked to one of his best friends, and then he just like reached out to me offering advice, and I was like, "There's no fucking way <laughs> that someone on trial for murder is offering a stranger on the internet advice." Man, this guy's mad. Yeah. Anyway, and then he went. Then so I, I talked to him while he was on, just before he went back for being on trial for murder. Never to hear from him again. We were strangely, like, he's one of the only people that I know who were born, was born with the same disability. Mm. His mum died at the same age, thereabouts. And so very similar experiences growing up in terms of sports we played. Um, we had very different views on what the Paralympics should be. You know, he wanted to go to the able-bodied Olympics. I'm like, dude, you would never have made it to the able-bodied Olympics if you had real legs. There's no mm. way. Yeah. Just like his, the type of physique that he has, I have, it's, it wouldn't have been possible. So yeah, haven't heard from him since, but I do want to fight him when he gets out of prison. So I'd love to do a you know corporate boxing match. Oh, like a Oscar fight for Bistor, life. Yeah, against Oscar, because <laughs> that would be the only even fight that I could have, yeah. and that would be awesome. And You'd want to beat the fuck out of him, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, but I mean, he'd have that prison experience. <laughs> so it would be extremely tough, but I think I'd have him. I honestly think I'd... I, I, everyone I, would be rooting for you. So I you, know, but then if I lost, fuck. Embarrassing. Do, yeah. your, do, your, do your records on the track still stand? No, it's after they changed the rules. It'd okay. be like a new... It's like kind of putting new wheels on Formula One cars. Okay. So they, they reset everything. So, so you, do, you do that. So that's 2016? Mm-hmm. And then you come home, you keep running for another couple of years. Was One you, year, I was just injured for a whole year. Okay. I suffered from nerve damage and a... They don't really know what caused it. The speculation is that I had like a bone fracture... That then healed with like a calcium ridge that caused a bursa on the bottom of my stump, um, which lasted for like another two and a half years, and I never got it seen to. And then eventually got my leg reamputated, going into uh, going into COVID. So, so, so was your was your plan to keep I, going? Yeah, I, my yeah. plan was my yeah my plan was to was to like because I was only three years in. Mm. There were two things. One biologically was I going to improve? Absolutely. Like I was increasing everything, like just measurable things like my PR and squats, deadlifts, all, all of the powerlifting measurements still rapidly increasing. Then there's the technology side, right? So making all these improvements on the technology. I could have gotten insanely faster, especially in the 200 and 400. The 100's what, harder. What was your time for the four? Uh, 40 something? 40, uh, 46. Flat, yeah, but now it's bad. Like, and then in, in Rio, I wasn't, I didn't perform well, so I still won, and I wasn't performing at my best because I hated the village. I had, I'm a very sensitive sleeper. Like, I woke up at four, three thirty this morning. I couldn't get back to sleep just because, like, the light downstairs was on and coming through our door. And in Rio, they had blinds over the curtains. They had no real curtains, so the light shone in. They had buses that would go around the village twenty four seven, and the bus stop was outside my room, and it would beep. Every time it came down, because at the, the the bus would decompress or whatever on the airbags for the fucking wheelchair people, and so I had beep 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 every five minutes all night, and so I didn't I didn't actually sleep when I won my silver. I had no sleep. I did, went the whole night the night before without sleeping, and I still I still came second. And then the rest of the the two weeks was just a disaster in terms of being in a physiological optimal space to perform. So I would have performed a whole lot better at the Paralympics in a, in a different environment. Mm. Well, you still, you still did okay. <laughs> I still did okay, yeah. But I could have, I could have, been, I could have been a lot greater. Yeah. So w- was it a hard call to retire? No, or was it just you were, no. you were injured no, and just no, frustrated? No, no. Or? Uh, well, they changed the rules. I was injured. Right. I was frustrated. Um, and then you have to forward think. You're like, do you want to be 30 trying to make that transition? It's so much harder. And people like over-index both the earnings that an athlete makes – and like just for, I was probably making uh, like three hundred to four hundred fifty thousand a year, between like sponsorship, speaking, right. athlete money, all of sure. it. 
you over index on that because like they think it's so good at the time but then it's the life cycle of those earnings are very low but then yes. you over index on like the importance of like being an athlete and the you know your family's so proud of you and your friends parents uh you know talk your parents friends like yeah that's got to be intoxicating for the other people, not for me. And, like, for me, I'd already been through enough hard things in terms of, like, losing my mum mm. and everything else that, like, the ability to, like, distance myself from things is right. relatively easy and separate that. And then also I'm an amb- ambitious guy. The world's full of interesting yeah. things that you can just go out and start tomorrow. Like, I've got friends who have just started jiu-jitsu and now they're on a jiu-jitsu journey or whatever. And so there's always new things to do. Like, you didn't start running until later on in oh, life, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And so... Why just why just why just be an athlete your whole life? Well, I, I and I had a I had a guy on the podcast last week, Garth Barfoot, who's uh, yeah from his dad is Barfoot from Barfoot and Thompson, and he started doing triathlons in his fifties, and did, so didn't do an Ironman until he was in his sixties, yeah. which I think is fucking remarkable, insane. And yeah. but 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 it's just like I think that's how you should live, and that so you should always a find a, yeah, a but, new thing. But you. Um, so I, went I and mean, did the, f- from an ego perspective, yeah. like being an athlete, like it would be easy for you to be defined as, as that guy, like, you know, Liam Malone. The, the, Not really, the, because like most of my life I went through like school and my leg was falling off and, you know, at uni I was binge drinking and so I wasn't really like tied to any definition. If I'd spent like my entire teen years being defined as the Blade Runner, kind of like how Skipasaurus was, or, you know, you're a child athlete and you go through school and then university, you get a scholarship to the States, you make it into the NBA, then what do you do? Because yeah. that's your whole character. But if you're me, you've got that, you know, experience in a three-year time period after, like, the worst year of your life. And so to lose it again, is it hard? Absolutely. Yeah. But at the same time, I, like, navigated change and navigated those transitions before. So I was more, like, more adapted to going through that process mentally. Because it's a mental, it's a mental adaption. What would your advice be to someone that's thinking of a career pivot? Cool, yeah. Um, start learning everything online. Like, spend a ton of time on YouTube. But the way that you want to think about things from a career point of view is like, earning's going to be super important, right? But earning relative to how much effort you're putting in. And the way that you want to think about it is you want to look at the the mean earnings um, relative to effort within an industry and so like let me export <laughs> let me expand on that let me expand on that let me expand on that so like say you're a police officer yeah and yeah. you might have the idea of like you already work in kind of like the legal industry maybe i'll go become a lawyer right well you could go to law school and you could fan, you know spend five years and then like sit the bar but the reality is you're then going to go into a law firm and you're not going to earn that much money you yeah, remember, it's you, shit money for it, the first it, few years right yeah for most of it yeah. and then you kind of have to do this like pyramid scheme of trying to become a partner mm. okay and it's extraordinarily, you no, know, but that's kind of how it works. And it's extraordinarily stressful. Like lawyers are, you know, just burdened with an incredible amount of stress. Well, you, okay, so like maybe you go and you say, I want to go into finance. Well, you're now going up against a whole, you know, cast of extremely bright people competing for a very narrow market because the financialization of the economy has kind of already occurred. There's no longer any growth in that. So what else could you look at? Well, you would look, look at technology, for example, you know, there's the joke that uh, that you know technology workers have it so hard because you know, they start their their work at 10 a.m. and finish at 3 p.m. And the reason for that is because you know these these technology companies around the world are growing at you know 40 percent a year and have done for the last 20 years. And uh, so technology is probably the best place that you can go, and that can you could go into anything if you're like a people person, you can go into the sales, marketing side of things, operations. Or if you're like a more introverted person, you can go into the like solutions architects, DevOps, engineering mm. side of things, and your pay is extremely high because there's there's so few talented mm. people. But that stuff's like pretty easy to learn. Like you would not be best suited spending your time at university. You'd be best going on to like say you wanted to get a job at Amazon, going on to like Amazon's educational part of our website and just going through our resources, all our free courses, getting certified and certificates that we provide and going down that pathway. Cause it'd be much shorter and much more relevant. So that's kind of like my general advice is like, try to be less competitive in the things that you do. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Was that terrifying though to like turning your back on that? No, no, no. Yeah. But you said, you said before like 350, 400 grand a year, whatever you were getting. But I knew I could go and make that mm. elsewhere. Like I, I know that I can, that's, yeah, that's not that. I, f- I, feel like I don't think that's that hard to make. I, I feel like you, you, you're one of these characters that so you're going to have like numerous different careers in your lifetime. I feel like what you're doing now I is not... I hope not. Oh, really? 
No, because I don't think you can get extremely good at something. Having right. multiple different careers. It's, a, it's an incredible life journey zigzagging, but you won't master anything. Oh, you're going to get bored, though. You're gonna oh, yeah, no, that, that's true. <laughs> but, like, my, my work at the moment is it's so diverse in terms of the number of business, businesses that I touch and the incredible people that I meet. So it's, it satisfies sort of a lot of those notes. Just, like, on the topic of, like, going and doing new things, I went and did the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Like, so... Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah You yeah, tried yeah. your hand at stand-up comedy Correct. for a while. So, like, six... Fuck, so, that is big ball stuff there, But mate. I think you have to do these things. That's terrifying. It's fucking horrifying. Um, and so, anyway, most people, like, the way that Fringe works is you'll, you'll set yourself the goal of going to Fringe. You'll spend, I don't know, a year developing a show. The process of developing a show for a comic is a process of elimination where they use rejection as a tool, right? You're using the audience to reject jokes that aren't funny. And so, like, I've seen Chris Rock, for example, when he's working on a show, just go up with a giant notepad, and he's reading the jokes off this notepad and putting ticks and crosses next to the jokes that work and don't work. Oh, yeah, I saw Reece Darby at the Classic do the same thing. Exactly, okay? And so then Mm -hmm. using that as a filter, using the audience as a filter... Anyway, usually you do it for a year. I did this in like, you'd work on it for a year and you'd have a show, then you'd tour the show and then you'd finish the tour by going to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And usually you wouldn't go to Fringe unless you'd been performing for four years or something until you're like a really good craftsman Mm -hmm. at whatever you were doing because it's like theatre, comedy, all sorts of performing arts. I did it in six months because like one of the things I think you should ask yourself is like how can you achieve what you want to achieve like a much shorter timeline? (laughs) <laughs> this seems to be like a thread in your life. Because, no, but because then you can like think about what's like the val- what are the valuable actions to take and not get distracted by all the other nonsense. And anyway, so I get to the Fringe Festival. I spend an entire month. You spend you do thirty shows. You do a show every single night, and um, you face a ton of rejection doing that. And so rejection it, in terms of like the crowd, not yeah, totally, yeah, totally. Okay. So like the interesting thing was is like the average audience size for the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I think it's like four to seven people. You are competing mm. against thousands of other performers, whether yeah. it's theatre or comedy. So it's hard to get people to your show. I arrive at the venue on the first night. The staff come out and they say, how did you do it? And I said, how did I do what? They said, you, f- you sold out the first week. And at that mm. moment, the Scottish Disability Association bus shows up <laughs> outside the venue. I just looked at the venue staff and I said, fuck, I've got jokes about these people. The whole show is jokes about these people. The whole first week was disabled people showing up to my show for me to make jokes about disabled people. And they were the best audience that I had the entire time. But you you were making jokes about yourself, though. No, all sorts of disabled people. Jokes about disabled people in the Paralympics, jokes about people in the audience, all sorts. And so, but they were the best audience themselves because if you want to be treated equally, you have to be able to laugh at yourself. And... They were the best audience that I had, and then they all left after the first week, and then you kind of get, you know, the audience size reduced from you know, 70 people a night to probably, I don't know, 30 or 40, which was still massive mm. at Fringe. And you get, like, able-bodied people coming up to you afterwards. My sister's cousin's daughter is in a wheelchair. You can't make jokes about them. And you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> and so so you get that sort of rejection. You get jokes that just don't land, and some nights they work, some nights they work, some nights they don't work. It just, just, it just doesn't matter. It just yeah. doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Rejection just doesn't really matter that much. Did you? But, let me, let me, let me, let me caveat that. Like mm. you've spent time with Madison this morning, my girlfriend. We were on dates five years ago. Ended up like blowing me off. Rejected. Comes full circle. She she said it was a game of persistence on your part. Exactly. <laughs> never give up. The never give up. Energy. So one way to think about it is your willpower versus their willpower, and most people don't have a lot of willpower. <laughs> you you guys look like you got a great relationship as well. And she she was up early. Have you changed her, or no, no, is she no, no. as she's, driven no. as she's even more driven? Maybe because right. you're a media person. She's a media person. I don't know how you guys do it because she's up at 4 a.m. to go and do TV. So I a uh, huge amount of admiration. Yeah. You know, and then you guys are up at 4 a.m., not just to work a desk job, you're trying to entertain people, which requires so much energy and, like, not enlightenment, but just, like, keeping people's attention is so, so difficult, especially yeah. at this time. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know mm. how you guys do it. 
Do, from um, from your your time as um as an athlete, were there any skills that were transferable? To- All of them. Say so you want to like change your life. I think the most important thing to start with is just like changing yourself. The easiest thing to do, I think, is change physiologically. That's why I think just sort yourself out physically. All those principles can be then applied to whatever you need to do academically or intellectually. So just like going to bed early, type of food that you're consuming, um, you know, what you do in your spare time, because you're not out binge drinking. I mean, some athletes are, but, you know, most aren't. All of those are just like the foundation of which you can build other things on. That the, those yeah. are like you don't need anything else, and then just like persistence, and then you know run slow to run fast. You don't go out and try and break a PR. I mean, you run fast. I see you all the time on Tamaki Drive. You're a fast runner, but you're not out there trying to run a whatever two hour something marathon every single time. And so you learn that through repetition, you know, it's not about a one off, you know, effort in order to to make change or to learn new things. It's about just repetitively doing things and no matter where you begin, you can end up being a very different person. You started out at 30 running. I'm pretty sure you were overweight at the time. I'm Massively. Looking, and, and how old are you now? 49. 40, you're 49? Wow, I need your genes. But you're like a lean, healthy-looking guy, you know? You, feel, uh, you, you, I, probably, I feel, you, you probably feel amazing <clears throat> mentally and... But that wouldn't have happened overnight, I'm, I'm guessing. No, no, it was a very slow transition. And the reason I started running in the first place was to lose weight. And then just after a few months, I started feeling mentally good and I stopped obsessing about the weight and I, I just didn't even bother about it. And then it just happened over time. Cool. So let's now relate that to someone who, going back to your example of like, uh, you know, people who want to maybe change careers. Yeah. Just start practicing the things that those other people do in their jobs. And you just start and just do that every single day, and eventually you become that person. Yeah, I mean, you, you've. I mean, everything's I think, obvious. I think fear, fear is the thing that would hold a lot of people back from doing it. But you've like had so much courage. Yeah, but I've also had so much, like, I've had so many consequences of failure. Like, I've what had do you my, mean? okay, so like, at primary school. Uh, we had athletics day up at the intermediate that I was going to. There were like 1,200 kids there. So my entire primary school and the entire intermediate that I was going to be going to, 1,200 kids, they put all the fat kids and the kid with no legs all in one race to like make it even, right? So it's like KFC versus disability. Anyway, I'm at, I'm at, this, this race starts off. And I, 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 you know, I was stoked with that, to be fair. I'm at 50 meters in this race. I'm in third place. My leg begins to come loose. I didn't duct tape it up because my mum missed my my running race, right? And my leg falls off in front of 1,200 kids. Like, flies off. I do, like, a couple of rolls. Everyone laughs. Like, how can you not laugh? It's that, fucking funny. How can you not laugh at that? I would be in hysterics. Everyone was in hysterics. That's a lot of laughter. Like, if you can make 1,200 people laugh, cash a check. But laughing with you or at you? It, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't does, matter. It does matter. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Either way, like, w- without a doubt, of course, like, I cry because it's embarrassing. And the principal runs Aww. over, I put, put, puts my leg back on. Uh, my friend's mum, Louise, makes me finish the race. She's like, she's the most driven person that I know. And I get to the end, I get back, and then <clears throat> my mum shows up late for my race with the roll of duct tape. And she tapes <laughs> up my legs and she makes me run the 200, right? So, like, there's, and the, the, there's just like a never ending series of stories that I have like that. Uh, where I've had maximal embarrassment and it's not that bad because like the next day you know someone else embarrasses themselves they're worried about what everyone thinks about them and it's just like an endless cycle of of that and so there's you know the consequences of failure aren't as bad as anyone thinks hence why the fear is typically you know not worth overweighting too much Mm. yeah man that's such a good attitude uh, I guess, I guess, I don't know, but I just, I, I, I you know, I just, the, what good does, mm. you know, just overthinking about things yeah. bring? Like, it never brings any happiness, it doesn't improve the likelihood of a good outcome, and so you might as well just do the thing, even if it ends in embarrassment. Yeah. Where, where are your, your medals now from the, from the game? I mean, I've got Did one up, I've got one upstairs, yeah. um, in just like my sock drawer. Uh, the <laughs> others, yeah, I, like, I'm not a big fan of, like, looking back at things, um, even though it was a special time, but... The others are just like down in Nelson in a wardrobe mm. somewhere. I don't know. It'd be, it'd be nice to have them on display. And, it would. In fact, look, look I'm going to get one of them and I'm going to cut the like 
thing, what would you call it? Like the thing that goes around. A ribbon? Head. Yeah, I'm cutting the ribbon off because it's orange and I hate it. It's like orange and gold doesn't work. <laughs> Someone with a disability designed that. <clears throat> so I'm going to get that, but I'm going to frame it and have like a nice white, clean, slick background or black or something, and I'll, I'll put that up on display. But for the most part, you're right, I should have done something yeah. with them. Yeah, totally. Shit, um, it, it has been... It has been so good sitting down with you today. I've I've um I've been a fan of yours for years. I'm full of admiration for for everything you do and everything you've done. Um, it has been so bloody difficult, and it's taken so much work to pin you down. Though, do you do you not really like talking about yourself? Oh, or, I just, you know, here's how I would describe it. I'm not trying to discourage <laughs> you from doing a podcast, like, uh, and I know you've written a book, and I'm not trying to hate on you three, for writing a book. Three books. Shit, author. Okay. There's like, I get people asking me like, oh, why when are you going to write a book? I'm like, you know, more people should read. I just don't want to put people off reading if they read my book. And so it's like the same thing. People are going to listen. Well, why? Let that guy, he's had no legs. It's been kind of tough. They get the gist. I, I, I don't know. That's why I'm like, I don't think I'm like worthy of being a podcast, of being on like a podcast. Cause I, what are people going to get from this, you know? That, that's just how, how I kind of think about it. And then on top of that, I'm just, okay. I'm so busy. I'm just so busy, man. I'm just like I'm, I've been I've been away, you know, three times a week with work for the for the last three weeks. I've barely seen my girlfriend, and so, you know, it's just a busy time. And so you've pinned me down at the best time of the day. And also, you know, kudos to you. I've been a fan of yours. Do you remember when uh, McDonald's when you guys were campaigning to bring oh to back, bring back the McFlurry? We spoke on the phone. I was uh, 15 years old. I just got my restricted license, and I called in because you guys were meant to be not you specifically, but an Edge Roadrunner was supposed to be at the McDonald's in Nelson, and it was a no show. We'd all made signs, and I rung in. I said. Where the hell is the Edge Roadrunner? We're here. We want our McFlurries. You know, like, hang on. And then you got someone to come down, and we got a fo- uh, me and the Edge Roadrunner got a photo with all of my friends from Nelson campaigning to get, to get the McFlurries back. Hang on, pause. Was that paid for by McDonald's? Was that was a promotional no, campaign? No, I knew no. It. Genius yeah, marketing. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people won't know this, but um, the McFlurry there was a period where it wasn't in New Zealand, and we sort of campaigned to brought it back. And we McDonald's were fucking pissed off with us. They're like, we've we've got a marketing schedule mapped out for the next eighteen months. We can't, we can't, we can't do it. Like we can't bring it forward. But um, I believe we were the catalyst for them bring it back. Old. They they were going, oh no, the machinery and the, you know, the, the snow freeze machine's always broken. Yeah, there's some some excuse or whatever. But anyway, the McFlurry's back on the menu now. Yeah. and God bless it. So that was our first interaction. Oh, Been a fan of since, and uh, thank you for having me on. Do you allow yourself? Sorry, I've just got another question. Do you allow yourself some downtime? Do you have some downtime? I mean, being busy is good, but it's also good to. <sighs> My general view is like. Um, Going back to the happiness thing, because I've been in states where I've like been drifting and being useless and life has like gone backwards, my general view is like you're either growing or you're shrinking. And so like that just kind of compels me where I feel like I need to be doing things all the time and I feel happy when I'm doing things because I know that the likelihood of something bad happening is less likely. Mm. Yeah, mm, does Mads like say to me from time to time like you need to chill absolutely um you know we go to duck island and we go out for dinner and have a date night and stuff yeah duck island's an ice cream place ah, it's so good yeah. god damn them. So what are they good. putting in that stuff so good yeah it's well you know uh, i'll reiterate um i've i'm full of admiration for you and i wouldn't get up at 7 a.m on a sunday morning to do a podcast with many people well, thanks, Tom. I really appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, yeah, you're a good dude, and um, I, I love following your journey in life because you've got such a great attitude about things. Hey, likewise, And, you, you, and you, you, I, your drive puts other people to, to shame. It makes me feel like I'm not doing enough with my own life. Yeah, well, I've got a, a, a boy you should meet who's uh, one, of, one of my guys, and he, will, he puts everyone I know to shame. Yeah. He would have been up at 4.30 this morning and, and doing something outrageous. Oh, it's a and Sunday, yeah. What are you, he's what got are a you, cool story. What are you doing today? Why did I have to come around at 7? If what, if you came around at 3 o'clock, I'll be here, I'll be half asleep, oh, okay. I'll be fatigued. You're getting me at my favourite time of the day where there's like less chaos going on in the house and it's just it works a little bit better. Damn, yeah. Kanye is a cute dog. Look at him. He's Why is my dog not, not behaving yeah, like Yeah, Kanye's that? been sitting on my lap this entire time. Your dog's a monster. Like how many kilos? 30 kilos? 40 kilos. 40 kilos? Mm-hmm. Shit. 40 kilos of pure escape artist. Yeah, so he's ended up down at uh, a few of the 
local Oraki houses. Yeah, and Madison, your girlfriend was telling me he goes, goes missing like a couple of times a day, and mm-hmm. the neighbors feed him and mm-hmm. look after him. Mm-hmm. He loves it. <laughs> you always go to pick him up, and you're going to growl at him, and he looks so happy. And you're like, I can't growl at him in front of these people, otherwise they're going to think he's escaping some you know torturous home. We love him, but God, he's just it's four dimensional chess with that dog. Mm. Hey, um, well, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. I'll uh, let you get that workout done. And, um, yeah, really, just, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Dom. Thanks very much for listening all the way through this episode of Runners Only with Dom Harvey. Just a quick one before we leave. If your podcast platform allows, please rate this podcast or write a review for it. And if you like what you hear, please recommend it to a friend or two who you think may like it or even share it on your social media channels. Also, any feedback, guest tips, sponsorship inquiries or anything else, please do get in touch. DomHarveyNZ at gmail.com is my email address. Or you can slide into my DMs on Instagram, DomHarveyNZ. Okay, thanks very much. Hope to see you next week on Runners Only.